Good morning, everyone. I call this meeting of the Public Accounts Committee to order. Uh, we have with us this morning the Office of Regulatory Affairs and Service Effectiveness. Let's start with introductions, beginning with Mr. Horn. Thank you. My name is Bill Horn. I'm MLA for Waverly Fall River Beaver Bank. MLA Suzanne Lunas Croft, Lunenburg. Benjamin Jessam, Hammonds Plains, Lucasville. Joachim Strong, Califax, Shabakto. Ian Rankin, Timberley Prospect. Good morning, welcome. My name is Tim Houston, I'm the MLA for Picto East. Good morning, uh, Dave Wilson, MLA for Sackville Cobbacud. Alan McMaster, MLA for Inverness, your chair. We also have with us this morning uh, our Auditor General, uh, Mr. Pickup. Um, okay, let's uh, also our guests uh, will introduce themselves and give you some time uh, for some opening comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my name is Fred Crooks. I'm uh, Chief Regulatory Officer for the province, and, and I lead the uh, Office of uh, Regulatory Affairs and Service Effectiveness. And with me is uh, Leanne Hashi, who's a, uh, an Executive Director in our office and who has a, a significant um, uh, leadership capacity in the regulatory initiatives that our office uh, is overseeing. So I do have um, uh, with your permission, Mr. Chairman, um, a few opening remarks, which I'll, I'll try and keep brief. So we're, we're obviously uh, delighted uh, to have the opportunity, uh, Mr. Chair, to be here uh, to uh, provide you with a, an overview of the work of our office. Uh, we're, we're, about, we're just under two years into our uh, mandate, um, and, and put simply, uh, our job is, with, with the help of both uh, business and our colleagues in government, to find pra practical, workable ways to cut red tape and to reduce the cost of doing business in our province uh, and our region uh, to make our region uh, stronger economically and a more uh, competitive uh, marketplace, uh, given the um, uh, which is which is a, a good objective for any jurisdiction, but given the fiscal and demographic challenges that the Atlantic region faces, uh, it, it, our mandate, uh, we believe, uh, has a more added urgency than might otherwise be the case. The, uh, the Joint Office was established initially by the governments of Nova Scotia and New Brunswick in, in March of 2015, and in November uh, 2015, uh, Prince Edward Island uh, joined the fold, so we were we were then fully maritime, and Newfoundland and Labrador uh, has joined in the office. They've been we've been working with them um, uh, informally. Uh, they they like what they saw and decided that they would uh, like to have full membership in the office, and they joined in December of this past uh, this past year. So it is now truly uh, um, an initiative that's Atlantic in scope. I think all four provinces see the potential. Uh, and the benefit of a shared approach to uh, regulatory reform and, and uh, modernization, uh, both for the individual provinces and, and collectively. So uh, again, in general terms, recognizing that this is an overview and maybe a bit of an introduction to the office for, for some members of the committee, we'll, I'll keep my brief re remarks fairly basic at the outset and then let the questions uh, that you have define the agenda. So the, f the first sort of a uh, major aspect of our office's role is is, is leadership uh, in this space, and and we've, <clears throat> in that regard, led the adoption of principles to guide our regulators uh, and to act as lead agency in ensuring uh, culture and practice within governmental institutions uh, and in the relationship between government and business uh, that that are consistent with regulatory goals. And those, those principles are reflected in the Charter of Governing Principles for Regulation, a uh, copy of which I think is available uh, in the package that was circulated to uh, the committee. But, the, but <clears throat> without going through that in detail, the core themes really are um, to, uh, in developing regulation, to make sure that there's a clearly articulated policy need at the outset. Know the problem you're trying to solve. Sounds like common sense, and it is common sense, uh, but not always uh, common in, in, in practice. The second principle uh, is that regulation should not be 
a first resort. Uh, it, it should be something that, that uh, it, th there are circumstances obviously where regulation mandating a course of conduct or a course of behavior or requirement is appropriate. Uh, but it should not be when, the, when there's a policy problem identified, it should not proceed uh, in a regulatory form uh, kind of on a knee jerk or well let's write something and enact it. Uh, basis. And regulation, once you've concluded, once, once a regulatory body has concluded that mandatory um, uh, regulation is required, uh, the principles suggest, and these principles, by the way, have been adopted by the premiers of all four Atlantic provinces, as we'll mention, um, as a kind of framework for, for the office's work and for the work of government, uh, uh, the regulatory work of government. But regulation, if it's enacted, should be the lightest possible touch should be based on a solid cost-benefit analysis, to be based on a transparent and consultative process, so meaningful consultation early uh, and at periods uh, during the development process. Uh, and, and the other principle, which is important to the, to the Atlantic nature of the initiative, is that uh, government should proceed with a mindset across the Atlantic region that new regulation where possible should be aligned <coughs> across the Atlantic so that, so that we don't uh, continue to contribute to the patchwork of regulation that exists in the, in the various uh, provinces. Um, the office also facilitates burden reduction initiatives with departments and agencies in priority areas, uh, both within the province and across Atlantic uh, governments. The second main role that the office has is advisory advisory uh, to departments of government <coughs> on proposals for new regulation or changes uh, to regulation. Uh, and, and in that capacity, policy-wise, we're really neutral. Uh, we don't, we're agnostic on, on the policy direction, the purpose, uh, the, the fundamental purpose, if it's clearly articulated, uh, or the policy direction. Our role really is to um, uh, provide advice as to whether the means that have been proposed of, of uh, dealing with the policy initiative are consistent uh, with the charter principles that I've just mentioned, and in addition, uh, that there's, a, there's an understanding, um, yeah, a fairly robust understanding, estimate though it will be, of, of the cost that the proposal will uh, incur for businesses who are subject, particularly businesses who are subject to the regulation. And that's a, that's a piece of information, as w it's one of, the, one of the significant drivers <coughs> of, of an office like ours. That's, a, that's information that hasn't always been available, at least not in a systematic way in the past. Government uh, has uh, fairly consistently understood the cost of proposals to government itself but not the, not the uh, uh, have a sense of the cost to the regulated community. Um, the third um, sort of role of, of, of our office has been to develop uh, and, and implement an approach to measurement, <clears throat> which is uh, critical to the credibility of the initiative and the accountability ultimately of our office and of government for uh, making progress in terms of achieving a reduction in regulatory burden. And to do that, we've spent a fair amount of time in our first year uh, developing a tool uh, for estimating uh, the costs of regulatory proposals. Um, and, and we can, if, if there's interest, we can chat more about that. Fundamentally, it's based on what's called the standard cost model, which is a, uh, which is a model uh, uh, widely used among uh, OECD countries, particularly in, in, uh, in Europe and, and in Australia, and to some extent in Canada. So it has, it has uh, uh, it's, it's a tried and true uh, methodology. It's not perfect, but it's, 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 uh, it's well respected. And finally, our office, um, uh, you know, if you look at our name, it's Regulatory Affairs and Service Effectiveness. We've got a service component to our mandate, uh, and frankly, um, uh, one of the things after two years that we've discovered um, in depth, more in depth than, than I think I would have expected coming into the role, is that one of the, one of the, when, when businesses talk about red tape, businesses large and small, but it particularly bears on small business, they're talking sometimes about service. 
and, and getting access to government and getting support in terms of um, uh, really good quality customer service. And, and um, uh, that's, a, that's a, uh, one of the most significant areas, we believe, for attacking and reducing regulatory burden. And interestingly enough, um, very, very few other jurisdictions internationally have made service a priority uh, as a part of administrative simplification. Um, we, it, in that regard, we recently launched the uh, a service called the Business Navigation Service, <clears throat> which is a one-year pilot uh, run from our office, and the sole purpose of that is particularly focused on small and medium businesses, is to help them navigate the regulatory maze that has to be navigated um, uh, in starting a business or trying to cope with regulatory requirements on an ongoing basis, particularly if you're a small business. Uh, again, we can chat further about that. Um, our um, our office uh, reports on an annual basis. Our second annual report will be published in June of, of this year. Our, I think you have a copy of the report that we, that we published uh, last year. Uh, we're getting on in our mandate. Our act expires automatically unless it's renewed by the House after five years, um, uh, unless, it's, uh, unless it's determined that we, uh, that we continue. Um, and uh, so we've got a, we've got a fairly finite time to make a difference <clears throat> and we're very conscious of that. Uh, we're also a small group uh, so we're, we're really um, um, uh, we're trying to make, uh, make a difference in a short time. Um, so just to summarize some of our results to date or some of the areas where we've worked which may be helpful, there may be questions on some of these. Uh, the business navigation pilot which I've mentioned. Um, uh, the regional thing is really important uh, in the sense that uh, I see him over my five minutes, so Mr. Chairman, you can you can shut me down wherever you wherever you. I, I'm <laughs> happy to happy to take your direction on that. I've got another few minutes, but uh, if the um, the the one of the things that we think is significant is the fact that right across the Atlantic region, <clears throat> we've got and we spent some time on this. We've got one charter of principles for regulation that all provinces have adopt, have have. have uh, adopted, which is important in the sense of trying to get over the um, uh, patchwork of regulatory programs, often um, uh, programs that are not intentionally or deliberately different, but just because as time goes on, the provinces don't necessarily look to each other as models and, and um, the same policy purposes are served by significantly different administrative requirements. Uh, so we're, we're very pleased and proud of, of the fact that, of, of the provinces for having said, you know what, we're serious about this to the point that we're going to adopt the same principles, we're going to adopt the same act, <laughs> basically, there's mirror legislation in the four Atlantic provinces, and, and we're going to, uh, beyond that, we're going to commit to uh, f using the same model for measuring actual reductions to regulatory burden, uh, which is, which is uh, um, so on the regional front, uh, we're pleased about that. Um, a f an example of a few changes, and this, you know, the, the thing about this job is there's no sort of one fell swoop. It's a lot of incremental changes that are raised, many of them by small businesses themselves. Uh, people are saying, look, this is crazy, this is intolerable, this is asphyxiating, uh, and, and, and we want to have an ear for that. Um, we, we have ideas about a more comprehensive approach in the longer term, which we can talk about, but for example, the timing of minimum wage changes. Um, there's a, there's a, there's, there was a strong feeling that uh, if, we, if we weren't going to standardize minimum wages across uh, uh, Atlantic Canada, then at least we should standardize the timing so that businesses uh, operate across the uh, jurisdiction are, are uh, doing this at the same time. Um, in procurement, uh, you know, we have the Atlantic Agreement on procure Procurement that was put in place in, I think, in the 90s. Uh, and and those, those procurement agreements sound good when you do them and the principles are great. The problem is when you get underneath them and find out what actually has changed. For example, every jurisdiction has, uh, has had different terms and conditions a different format for the for the um, uh, for its procurement documents. One of the things was identified to us by business makes it really difficult and costly 
to do businesses in the, in the do business in the four provinces. So uh, we've we've uh, tackled that, and in fact have now have for the goods and services portion of procurement, we've got aligned documents for construction uh, that's coming. I think. Uh, the middle of this year. We've, the four provinces are in the process of adopting the Canada Revenue Agency's one business number uh, to make it easier for businesses to register and work with uh, uh, workers' compensation. We're in the process of mutually recognizing head and foot protection across the Atlantic region so that a, a hard helmet um, uh, certified by the Canadian Safety Association can be worn in any uh, Atlantic uh, province. We've standardized, or we're in the process of standardizing, we heard this in spades from the trucking industry, the carrier profile for the trucking industry, a kind of report card, uh, so that so that trucking companies don't uh, have one score in one province and a different score in another province, which affects insurance and bidding and all the rest of it. Uh, and we're moving from even, uh, you know, from four provincial licenses for occupations and activities like uh, uh, elevator, elevator technicians and amusement ride technicians and others to one regional license. So this, um, these initiatives are uh, not, I, I want to emphasize, they're not our initiatives. Uh, they're initiatives that in some cases we've facilitated, but there are technical teams in each of the departments, in each of the governments across uh, Atlantic that are working together on this. Um, I guess, let me end with one, uh, I think, core insight. First of all, uh, this is a world of trying to staunch the death of a thousand cuts, and it's and it's 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 sometimes hard. It's a long-term exercise, and it's sometimes hard to sustain momentum and see progress, and for people to feel it. But uh, the work is real. The second thing is, even though it's the accumulation of a whole lot of uh, uh, smaller irritants uh, that really, con and including service, that constitutes the, the, the real burden to business of red tape. The Atlantic Provinces Economic Council has estimated uh, in a recent report that if in the maritime provinces alone, 10 percent of the trade barriers that, a, that still exist among the maritime provinces uh, were eliminated. Uh, that would have a value to the maritime economy of something in the order of 1.2, 1.3 percent of GDP or about a billion dollars. That's 10 percent of the, of the constraints that are there. So, so we, we're approaching this from the point of view that Yes, red tape is about simplification. Yes, it's about incremental things. Uh, but there's a, there's a significant economic opportunity there for our province and for our region. I look forward to your questions, and I apologize for going over time. Thank you. We'll start with the PC Caucus and Mr. Houston for 20 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for those opening comments. Um, they certainly weren't amongst the briefest we've heard in here, but they, but they were interesting so I, I do appreciate that because it's an important it's an important topic um, it is something I mean we, we, when we talk about red tape and a lot of people might not really understand what red tape is to the normal person that is on the street but some regulation is good some is garbage right so we need we need to get rid of the, the garbage stuff that frustrates businesses and frustrates development and uh, I know I know that's what you're trying to do but it, I'm just not exactly clear on the focus of the office in terms of uh, the the regional cooperation versus the kind of internal Nova Scotia specific garbage we have I guess what would you say is your is your are, are you more focused as an office on the on the regional cooperation or are you more focused on the the internal Nova Scotia specific stuff or how would you how would you characterize the split of your of your effort mr. Crooks mr. chairman um, thank you mr. Houston on a, on a uh, percentage basis I would say um, I would estimate that the regional focus there are only eight of us uh, in terms of um, the regional focus is probably 40% uh, and, the, and the balance the, uh, within province focus is 60%. So the, so the regional focus uh, and Leanne who leads um, uh, our work uh, in terms of regional initiatives could describe um, uh, some of them. But we, we have um, 
basically we're constantly working with Nova Scotia and other Atlantic teams uh, on an agenda of initiatives. I would say that takes about 40% of our time. Then the balance is spent, it's, it's mostly internal. It could have some Atlantic benefit, but for example, um, uh, the navigator system and the service initiatives, those are provincial. Uh, they may, uh, other provinces might decide to model them. And the, and the, um, uh, the uh, targets for reduction of burden, uh, those are internal to Nova Scotia. Again, they might roll out to the, uh, to the other provinces, but the primary focus there is, is um, internal to Nova Scotia. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's, it's interesting because um, there probably hasn't been a government in history that didn't campaign or champion red tape reduction. And probably every single one of them, uh, we'll, we'll probably hear it very soon, Premier McNeil will probably be on a campaign trail saying how successful he's been at reducing red tape. And he'll be just like every former Premier before him. They're all saying that. And yet here we sit in uh, 2017, the CFIB re released a report that asked small business owners, um, how satisfied are you, are you with the current government's efforts to reduce red tape? And it was a shockingly high number. I think it was in the order of high 50s percent of businesses that said they're not, they don't, they're not satisfied. They don't believe that the efforts, because they're not feeling it, right? So, so what, what would you say to those people? Like when, when, when would they start to feel it? Well, uh, uh, thank you for the question. Um, a couple of the a couple of thoughts come to mind. One of the one of the biggest single challenges of this area is to get a measure of progress, uh, a quantitative measure of progress, like dollars reduced, uh, and and uh, that demonstrates um, uh, actual initiatives that translate into savings for business. So that's that's. And, and, and it's got to be a quantification that businesses and representatives of business organizations and the public service recognize as real um, and credible. Um, so that's, that's point number one. But point number two, which really goes to the question that you're asking is, um, even, so, if you, so if, you, you know, if you reduce um, uh, the burden, you estimate the reduction of burden at Five million or ten million, or how does that get felt? Well, it might. It, the truth is, it might not get felt, certainly in the short term, because the distribution over the number of businesses is is broad. So they they might not. You know, they might actually have some savings. It may be bigger in one sector than the other for a particular year, but they might not really feel it. And that's why we think um, the qualitative part of assessing our performance is really important. So, so uh, dollars aside, you know, and, and, and it's important to have an objective measure like dollars, but dollars aside, one of the things that, that we did was we went out to businesses and surveyed them about their level of satisfaction. And, and what were your that, results, sorry, were your results similar to the CFIB where it was a very high level uh, yeah, well, of dissatisfaction? Yeah, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a high level of dissatisfaction uh, with the relationship mm -hmm to government. Uh, I think that, that's, and I think it's consistent, uh, frankly, I, I think as CFIB would say, I, you know, I don't, I can't speak for CFIB, but I think it's consistent in many jurisdictions. Um, uh, and, 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 and we, one of the things that we're really going to have to focus on, as I say, is the qualitative part of that, where you not only get the, you get the numbers and you get a spreadsheet that says, look, this is an estimate, it's defensible, it's not perfect, but it's defensible, it's directionally, we're moving in the right direction. But ultimately, if we're not tracking how people feel, are they feeling it? Are we getting at the pain points? Are we getting at the irritants? Are we getting at the things that are real? Forget about how you quantify that uh, globally. Are we really getting at the stuff that is making life miserable for people who are just trying to get run the business? So, um, so, so the answer. So my answer is, um, I'm not surprised that that uh, uh, that there is a there isn't a strong feeling of uh, it's made a huge difference uh, what's been done today. 
Um, and the other, the other thing is, I think in most jurisdictions uh, where that have been at this for many years, even on a best practice basis, you, you know, we're never going to be able to get to the point where, um, much like in the private sector in the customer service side, you're never going to get to the point where you can eliminate complaints 100%. But you, what you can, what you can do is get, is be number one, get the rate of dissatisfaction materially down, and then have systems and processes in, in place that allow you to really go at complaints in an aggressive way. And I, so I, that's yeah. a, what you identify is real. It's a concern, and we're still thinking about how, like, how do you, so how do you measure that? How do you make sure people Which are feeling? Which is kind of so. <clears throat> yeah. If 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 the point is, <clears throat> and I think the point is valid that. On the qualitative scale, yes, the feel-good scale, people don't feel good about it. Right. People are dissatisfied. Business owners are dissatisfied. They feel like there's a lot of hurdles in front of them. Yep. So there hasn't been there hasn't been meaningful progress towards that over, over governments. Maybe going back in time because they just don't feel satisfied with the relationship with government. So I found it interesting. Uh, that um, this government and the finance minister took a different approach uh, recently and tried to tried to basically tell people, I know qualitatively you might not feel movement, but I'm going to tell you that there has been. And at the Chamber of Commerce luncheon, he put a number out there. He threw a quantitative, right. his own assessment of how successful his government has been or will be at reducing red tape. Because he said, well, qualitatively, they're never going to, they know it's not true, so we put a number to it and maybe maybe get some interest here. And I was very interested in that number. He threw a number out of $25 million. You're right. probably familiar with that number. Yes, I, am. I was seated in the room, uh, and as, a, as, a, as a, I looked around the room, and there was a lot of smirks and, and chuckles because people, people knew it was just a number. Um, because qualitatively, they weren't they weren't feeling that. And I don't know if it was the messenger that was <laughs> the the source of the, the smirks and chuckles, because there's a lot of disconnect in many ways there too, or the message. It was probably both. The number of twenty five million dollars is very interesting. Is that a number that you were familiar with before you heard the minister say it at the yes. chamber? Is it a number that is supportable? Yes. Could is it a number that you could? table something for this committee to look at that says, well, this is where the 25 million comes from? Well, uh, so I guess a couple of things. One is um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, say that there hasn't been progress, and I don't want to compare what we've done with, what, uh, uh, with programs before, but I think we are building, frankly, um, and, and, and I think if you, um, if you uh, uh, at least what our stakeholders tell us, and I'm thinking of people like um, uh, Canadian Federation of Independent Business, the Halifax Chamber, the Atlantic Chamber, the Greater Halifax Partnership, uh, the Federations of Labour, the, 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 the broad range of businesses who we work with, we hear a lot of, uh, uh, of support and expressions of satisfaction. They want to believe. Sure, of course with, they want to believe, with right? The, with the, with, yeah, and I'm not, I, I'm not, I, your question, <clears throat> fundamentally, I agree with where we have to go in terms but of But in this. terms of the specific question of the $25 million, Oh, yeah, no, I'll come, I, I, absolutely, I'll come okay. to that, but, I, but there, was, <clears throat> there were just some things in your, in your question that I, I wouldn't want to leave the impression that, that I don't believe there's, I think we're doing the things that are necessary to do <clears throat> to build up the infrastructure and process uh, that will enable, we need both quantitative, demonstrable, as, as, as the Chamber and CFIB and other businesses point out, you need those targets, you need those quantitative targets. You also need to go to the qualitative. So on the 25 million, um, that's, that's, uh, uh, that's a, uh, I believe that that's a, uh, an achievable uh, number. It's an aggressive number. Um, uh, there are there are a number of uh, if you're interested in the in the sort of the context for that I'm happy to happy to provide it. Hey, well, I'm, uh, I'm I'm interested in the in the specifics of it. Can you is there can you give us a little can you give us ten line line, line items that say well five million comes from this and seven comes from this and two comes from is it something that you can no, actually a, put no, in front of us? No, it's a it's it's at this stage a target. It's it's been developed it's been it's been developed on the basis of. Uh, of um, um, uh, a number of things, including, but if, but, if, but, but a even a target would have components to it. So well, can we at least, for example, 
The, the um, well, they'd be, I can tell you, in terms of kind, there'd be initiatives a lot like some of the initiatives that you've heard now, you've heard announced to date. So, uh, take the, uh, uh, take the, um, uh, just by way of example, the car dealerships uh, that no longer have to come to the registry of motor vehicles um, and, and can do that online to process the uh, permits. Um, uh, our economist estimated uh, in consultation with the businesses and the, and the service Nova Scotia that that would produce something like $700,000 a year in, in diminished cost. Um, there are a range of things like that that would, those are the kinds of initiatives that will make up that 25 million. Okay, and so can it's we that, have a, can it's we that, have a, it's that kind of thing. Can at we have a summary state, of those, like a this, succinct summary? We have a summary of what's been done, but in terms of that target, uh, that's something that, that's something that uh, in terms of the specific, of the content that is going to be you know what what are the specific items that that's going to be comprised of there is no list at this stage but there is a, a, a strong sense based on what's happened in other jurisdictions the size of the burden that as it's been estimated by stats can in Nova Scotia as it's as it's been estimated by CFIB percentages of, of uh, burden reduction that appear administrative burden reduction that appear achievable based on the experience in other jurisdictions and um, a sense of, from departments, a very preliminary sense of what, um, because we've co consulted both inside and out preliminarily, of what could be done. Yeah, but beyond, so, beyond but so that, still, so to, yeah. I, I'm having trouble getting context for it. It just feels like a number to me. Like, no, uh, it's uh, not. It, it's well, it's it's a number in the sense that it's it's a it's a target number. But it's but a is number there a math? A, is there math behind it? A yeah, bunch but, of well, things I, add up to this, or a bunch of like. Yeah, well, there's not a list right now that totals up to 25 million. So, so okay. and it would be premature to have that, mm -hmm. frankly, because our whole approach is quantify, mm -hmm. make an estimate of what's achievable, um, uh, uh, commit to mm -hmm. it, and, and along with our stakeholders, uh, identify the specific things that are going to be done in order to implement that. We're, we're so, it's, so you could have picked 125 million, no. or you could have picked 5 no. million. No, we couldn't confident, so. because we've got a sense, uh, a preliminary sense admittedly, we've got a sense of the size of the burden. So, so internationally, the, the uh, sort of guidepost for what's achievable in the reduction of, of burden is probably in the range of 20 to 25 percent of burden. That's, that's over, over a period of years. Um, our sense, it's preliminary, but looking at CFIB data, StatsCan data, our own research, is that the addressable burden in Nova Scotia uh, is, is somewhere in the vicinity of, um, uh, of uh, 225 million. The, the addressable burden is no, the 225 million. The, 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 yeah, the, the, and the portion of that addressable was actually I shouldn't have used the word addressable the total burden is in the in the provincial is in the vicinity of 200 225 million the if you take a um, our businesses believe that up to a third of the time that they spend on compliance related activity is duplicative or unnecessary so a third is interesting if you look at the international standard it may be 25 percent um, uh, uh, of the burden that is capable of being reduced. So what this, what, what the 25 million would be over a very short period of time, which is the uh, time that the minister announced, would be what we believe uh, is 10 to but, but 10 no, per, 10 percent of the burden. But no way to ever measure whether or not it was. Cheap. So here's oh, yeah, here's oh, yeah. the thing. Here's here, the thing. Here's, yes, but here's but, the thing, though. Just like yeah, just sure. so you understand where I'm coming from. Yeah. Four years ago. Um, the, the Liberal Party campaigned on a promise of a doctor for every Nova Scotian. Everyone knows about that promise. Through public accounts, I've, the Department of Health has been here numerous times, the New Health Authority has been here numerous times. I've always been trying to understand, had anyone thought about that? I don't think they thought about it. I think the Premier had a, somebody in the Premier's office said, you know what, that's an emotional topic for people. Let's, let's put something out there. Let's say a doctor for every Nova Scotia. I have the Department of Health here ask him how many, how many doctors would it take for a doctor for every Nova Scotia? We don't know. How many people need? We don't know. There was nothing behind it. It was an emotional, political promise. So now, 
Flash forward, four years. I'm just asking, yep. the minister put a number out there, 25 million. My sense right now, after this long of discussion, emotional promise, nothing behind it. That's well, what I feel right now. So that's why I'm asking, okay, can well, you show me where the 25 million came from? And, and if we can't show me where 25 million came from, it's a doctor for every Nova Scotian. It's a magic yeah. number, it's something to say. Well, that's I, what I feel like. There's opportunity here to dispel my, to make me feel better about the 25 million, but if there's no math, then it's just a number. Well, there, there is math. I, I've gone through some of the math with you. What there isn't is, what you're saying is, if you can't show me a list of the specific programs or things that are going to uh, 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 add up to the 25 million now, then this is not achievable. Well, is, I, the math, with re, with is the math, is, is, tw is the math as simple as 25 million is a part of 225 million, it's whatever that is, 10%, I guess. Right. And that's what we've identified as we can achieve, 10% of some 20, 225 million. Is that what we're talking about here when, when 25 million comes Yeah, up? It, it, that. Uh, <coughs> consultation with departments, preliminary consultation with departments, um, and, and the pace, the work that we've done to date, we know that we, know that, uh, we have uh, six or through six or seven initiatives uh, that we have costed, we've achieved over the last year or so, uh, $2.2 .2 million in Nova Scotia alone in reductions. And that's probably, that $2.2 .2 million is probably uh, uh, 10 to 20%. We, again, we're, we don't have the resources to cost everything that's been done, but we, we believe the number is actually much larger uh, than the 2.2 million. So the experience of the first two years tells us, mm -hmm. along with international best practice, what's been achieved in jurisdictions that have done this, and the information we have from CFIB and others, and our own research to quantify the size of the burden, we're saying $25 million is achievable. And I, the, additionally, it's not a bald promise, in other words, uh, 25 million will be there, trust us. This is something that will need to be measured and will be measured using the costing tool that our stakeholders uh, and public servants have said we have confidence in this tool to provide numbers uh, that, that uh, we think are reasonable. So, so I guess, uh, you know, I can't make any comment on the doctors, but I, uh, but I can tell you this. This is based on my advice. This program is based on my advice. And I'm going to be happy, and I fully expect to come, in, come here or anywhere else to show as we as we carry through this program to demonstrate based on to demonstrate the math based on our, on our costing tool of the reductions that have been achieved. So I don't see this as a it, 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 this is I'm not a mat, I'm not a pull on the number out of the air kind of person. <laughs> I'm accountable for this number. Frankly, that's clear, and and I have every intention of delivering it, and I believe we can. It's realistic. Order. Thank you very much. The time has expired. We'll move to the NDP caucus and Mr. Wilson for 20 minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, just quickly, um, your office, I would, I would assume it's, it's what you would consider arm's length from, from government. Are you, are you able to talk freely, to uh, maybe criticize or speak up uh, when you see the government uh, bring forward changes to regulation or a policy change that may create more barriers. I know, you know, in the mandate, eliminating barriers on new or existing regulations and services to enhance economic opportunities is kind of your mandate. So do you have that freedom to, to criticize, to uh, speak up? If, if you see something that the, uh, the government is doing that uh, you know, goes against kind of the mandate that has been established for, you, for, for the office? Mr. Crooks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we, we've got a kind of a, um, a dual sort of role. Um, one of the reasons, uh, one of the things was very important to me at the outset was that we, there was an initial thought that we might be at a part of a department of government, the Department of Business. I felt very strongly that, in fact, we should be standalone. Uh, because if we're evaluating um, uh, uh, things that are being initiated in departments, we should stand apart. The other thing is we're a small group. 
uh, and we could easily get overwhelmed with the management processes that exist in larger organizations. So, so, so we are standalone. Uh, we have, we have, um, you know, we have a. Uh, as a result of that, I believe a very strong uh, relationship uh, and a level of candor with our external stakeholders that might be uh, harder for other departments uh, to achieve. Um, and in general, yes, I, I've, I've, I think the expectation is uh, that the, the office was established by the government, as I understand it, uh, because the, the government was not satisfied with the, with the state of regulation and the burden that uh, businesses are experiencing. Um, and and um, um, we are completely free to um, uh, identify, in general terms, um, the things that we think are, or might, if they're being proposed, stand in the way of, of uh, ease of commerce. Now, now having, you... having said that, though, I, I've, got to, I've got to say this. We also are in a position where we provide advice to ministers and the cabinet on specific proposals. And that, uh, that advice is it just, uh, it's candid, um, and it's direct, uh, and it's uh, based on the charter of principles, and it's based on it based on cost. So, if you if you do but, have uh, if you do have some concerns, would you would you do that in a public manner, or is it just no. bring it up to the minister? So, I, well, I if, look in, I look at your office similar to to the Auditor General's office, right? They review what's going on, they make recommendations, but of course they have a, a method of reporting that sure, to this committee. Absolutely. So, do you do that in any kind of public form, or would you do it in a public form? Well, for example, we're in a different place on the continuum of independence and removal from government than the Auditor General's office. We're not, we're not, we're not set up, nor do we have the, uh, do we have that, that measure of independence or the responsibilities to, to uh, uh, publish our, our uh, observations in the same way. Um, uh, and, and part of that is we're, we're, the reason for that is we're advisors to government. Some of our advice uh, would be within the bounds of cabinet confidentiality. Um, but at the same time, we do have an obligation under our statute to make an annual report. And, and if the annual report says, I can tell you this, that if in a given year uh, the, the uh, quantity of regulation burden has gone up as opposed to going down, in our estimate and opinion, that's exactly what we'll be saying. Okay. Now, that might not be convenient, um, I'm, <laughs> you know, but... but from the point of view of our office, and I, I think the concept of our office is, if it's going to have, if this is going to work in the long term, this has got to have some credibility based on measurement and based on our saying, independently, we believe that globally, even though we may not be able to talk about specific pro programs where we've given advice uh, to a cabinet or a minister, globally, uh, this is going in the wrong direction. Uh, you know, so so removed in that sense. Okay. No, I appreciate that. But not that, as far. I, I wouldn't want. I wouldn't want to compare ourselves to the to the office of the well, auditor general. I don't think general. anybody can compare himself <laughs> to the office of the auditor general. Um, no, I appreciate that because I think it's some of the frustrations my my colleague has just yep. mentioned is that yes, okay, the current government set up the office, but uh, you know I, I can't predict a future, but yep. they're not going to be in government forever. Right. Um, I so, assume. so I hope that the office continues on to uh, to make sure that they hold whoever is in power to account uh, on 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 reducing barriers and and red tape, as as uh, as my colleague said. I mean, every government in the past knows that that has been a challenge for 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 businesses, especially small businesses in our community, uh, in our province. Um, so I'm going to go in an area where I don't think uh, too many people kind of connect the dots, I think, on, on, uh, on what goes on uh, and, and, and how, it how they contribute to the economy of our province. And that's, and I want to ask a few questions on if you've had any engagement uh, w on this, and that's uh, family physicians um, who many, many years ago set up uh, the system to really control uh, their overhead, control where they practice, how they practice, uh, and really, ultimately, they're, they're a small business. 
they hire clerical staff, they hire professional staff, they hire cleaners, they rent spaces in communities, they own buildings, they rent out buildings, um, you know, and on and on. They contribute to the economy. And in recent, uh, in the more recent last few years, there has been, in my opinion, some barriers put in place that limit uh, the ability for a physician to set up a practice wherever they want in this province. And of course, I'm talking about uh, the ability to get privileges and, and, and uh, license to, to do what family physicians do. Have you had any discussion? Have you been involved at all in, in the changes recently in policy that uh, requires additional um, approval from the Nova Scotia Health Authority for physicians to set up practices? Because we've seen now, especially more recent, you know, pharmacists who want to expand or, or are willing to go and get that physician and, and they've been denied. Long-term care facilities, other physicians who want to uh, expand their practice. And, and that contributes to our, our economy, especially in rural communities. So have you had any discussion on those barriers that are being place, placed on physicians currently? And, uh, and if you have, could you maybe elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, no, I, I can say straight up, no, we have not been involved in that. Um, and uh, uh, it's a, it's a, um, uh, so this is the first time I'm thinking about this as a regulatory issue. Um, and um, it's an interesting one. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so I, I'm going to have to take that away. If, uh, but, but yeah, no, take, it, take the, it away with, uh, with note. I'm. Yeah. Okay. I appreciate, Thank I you. appreciate the answer. I mean, if yeah. you look at, you look at the, you know, the impact. There is an impact. So, I'll have discussions on the other end. Maybe, maybe the physicians haven't thought about it, and and we have another. They have another right. tool right. Uh, to hopefully, uh, hopefully, uh, tear down some of the barriers. Right. I appreciate, I appreciate the that. answer to that. Um, of course, the, the current government ordered uh, early on in their mandate uh, a tax and regulatory review uh, a few years back. The, you know, that review was headed up by a former uh, Liberal uh, cabinet minister um, who later is, or is now appointed to uh, head of uh, Nova Scotia Business Inc. Uh, that report made a number of recommendations around regulations. Um, just wondering, has anything been done with that report? Has your office gone over it? Has there been any uh, changes uh, coming out of that report? And I wonder if you could maybe re have a, a response to that. Sure, um, absolutely. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the, the, um, we, we, were, uh, we knew that the report provided <clears throat> a lot of the context and, and rationale for the creation of the office. So we've been keeping a, a very close eye on it uh, and, and on on the recommendations. Uh, again, it's hard to estimate, you know, hard to quantify it, but I would say at this stage, we have accomplished about 80% of the uh, uh, recommendations in the report. And, I, and, and th the balance are things that are either on our agenda for, uh, for the coming year, uh, or are things that are sort of outside our um, our for the mandate of our office, for example, um, uh, some of the recommendations have to do with um, uh, digitized um, um, service arrangements um, and and dealing with forms that are being worked on. Uh, it's not that the, the points aren't being worked on, but they're being worked on in places like Service Nova Scotia, Internal Services and Communications Nova Scotia. So. Um, there's a and and you know we can we be happy um, we track this pretty closely we'd be happy to share with the you know, we prepared a um, a bit of a uh, format of comparing the recommendations that were made by in the Broughton report with what we've done and 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 where they leave if if. Uh, uh, that's something that we could uh, furnish to the committee. Yeah, if, I, don't, I don't know if, if you've uh, you've watched public accounts, but normally that's <laughs> that you've just answered my second question. Would be yeah, could you could you provide the committee with uh, sure. with that kind happy of flow do, chart or excellent. absolutely happy to do that. Good. Do you uh, do you recall the cost uh, uh, cost of that report? I mean, it was significant. I don't. Uh, 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 to I think it was about one hundred fifty thousand. Or but have have you been instructed? Uh, not to uh, move 
uh, in uh, in changing some of the recommendations by the deputy, the minister, the government at all, or have no, you been I'm, just I'm, looking at the report and and moving forward with it? I'm a I'm a deputy in my area, uh, despite the odd title, yeah. and I report to the premier. So I I, I guess I, I've been one thing I can say is I've had no instructions about Broughton or anything else in terms of delimiting what I can look at or what I should look at. Okay, thank you. Um, another area that uh, is going to be uh, upon us quite quickly is uh, the legalization of cannabis. Um, you know, we had a federal government that campaigned heavily on uh, on, on moving forward with uh, uh, legalizing it, uh, and what I see now happening is uh, is legislative change federally, um, and pretty much um, the the prime minister and the government kind of wiping their hands and saying provinces, territories, now it's your uh, go. Um, I see this as a, as a nightmare uh, around regulatory requirements. What work has been done uh, on, in the province and have you been engaged in, in that work? Uh, I think we're just, just over a year away from potentially having to have uh, this up and running in our province. So has there been any work and can you maybe give us some details on what that work entails? We, uh, thank you, uh, we, um, we have been engaged it's early days, um, and and um, you know this the the uh, driver on this is uh, uh, the Department of, of Justice, uh, but there's a cross departmental uh, a group uh, and that we're pleased to be part of. Uh, the the again our main focus is is the is the are the is the regulatory regime the most streamlined that we can have, and is it is it does it impose the least cost to business? So so. Um, we're engaged. We're engaged, and really, that's that's as much as I can tell you. Really, at this would stage. Uh, would distribution of of, uh, of cannabis through the Nova Scotia Liquor Corp make the most sense? Since uh, since they're, I mean, they're they're pretty much doing that with another substance right now. Uh, so there, there are many rules in place, there's regulations in place, there's a system of distribution in place. Uh, would you, do you have a comment on if that would be um, potentially the easiest way for us to ensure that uh, there is control? Um, because, I mean, I think that's some of the concerns we hear out there is, is how is this going to be controlled, make sure that it doesn't get into the hands of, of, of young people. And there's a huge marketing campaign, I think, on, on the negative effects of, of young people using cannabis. So could you comment on that? Is that would that be, a, I think, the most appropriate way to uh, get us to the point where in a year and two months from now, we're, as a province, are going to have to... Uh, allow uh, or have cannabis uh, available to the citizens of our province? Well, um, thank you for the question. I, I um, um, as I mentioned, we stay away from uh, the policy content uh, of this, and there's a policy, that's uh, mixed policy and process. Uh, the, but the main uh, thing I would say is that uh, I'm not well enough informed on that issue to be able to give you um, um, a meaningful or even maybe a sensible answer. So, so I'm going to I'm going to pass on that. Um, I, I I expect that that will be among the questions that will be considered, uh, given that the provinces have responsibility for distribution and and sale. One thing I will say is that I'm um, uh, which which could bear on what structure is uh, is adopted is there is some sign that the Atlantic provinces are. Um, interested as much as possible in aligning an approach. Now, whether that uh, whether that will happen, how far that will go, it remains to be seen. But that's a principle that we feel very strongly about. But I'm sorry that I can't be more responsive no, I, to your question. I appreciate the uh, openness and, and being clear on that. I, I do hope that uh, uh, that that is an, an area that the the government will look at. And and I, I I would think it's relevant to have your office involved in in this because I, I do see the need. Uh, for for uh, very strong regulations, um, and and it's it's one that 
it's not like you're you're taking it away from businesses now. It's it's going to be a new type of thing. So, anyways, I appreciate that. Uh, another area um, that I know more recent uh, we heard from from some business owners uh, was in the law amendments committee. It's around the sex accessibility, <coughs> excuse me, bill. Uh, and we know that uh, some business owners talked about the regulations required to uh, achieve accessibility as potentially burdensome. And that's their uh, word, not uh, uh, their definition, not mine. Yet those in the, uh, uh, in the community that uh, have been working hard to bring forward legislation um, want to ensure that human rights are affordable to all people, no matter what their disability is. And we shouldn't be looking at this as a, as a, a, as a, a barrier or red tape for, for businesses. Um, how would you, how do you define the balance here? Are you, have you been involved in the discussion and are you uh, supportive of the government and the move towards uh, ensuring that uh, basic human rights for people with disabilities are, are met and that the legislation should be strong? And this is not a, an area where we should be saying, oh, no, we shouldn't have these barriers in place. Uh, barriers, I guess, would be the wrong term, but the, you know, it, we shouldn't be looking upon this as red tape. Uh, when it comes to businesses because of surely just the human rights uh, for for people with disability? Um, I want to be responsive to your question, but, I, but a couple of things. We, yes, our office uh, was consulted uh, and and provided advice, uh, which would be within the within the bounds of uh, a cabinet confidentiality and and uh, so I really can't get into uh, the nature of that advice. Uh, the other uh, safe to say that our uh, focus, again, and I'm, I don't want to sort of whip a dead horse here, but our focus is really the charter principles and process and, and potential cost to business um, as opposed to, from a policy point of view, is this a good thing, are these admirable objectives, uh, that sort of thing. So, so our, we're, we're, we really are neutral on, on the policy objective, and uh, that's about as much as I can respond. I'm sorry we're, we're not having much luck in terms of me responding to some of your questions, but that's really, that's, that's uh, consistent with our role here. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. We'll now move to the Liberal Caucus and Ms. Lonis Croft. Good morning. Um, Good morning. Thank you for being here. I'm um, learning more about <laughs> your office. Um, I was interested to see that um, you are using the Broughton report, so it's not one of these government reports that are sitting on a shelf getting dusty, um, and you are going to submit um, how you are balancing out. Um, so can you give me a little bit more detail about how you are using the Broughton report? Absolutely, and I'm going to ask my uh, colleague Leanne, who's, who's uh, been tracking this fairly closely to, if you don't mind, Leanne, to respond to that, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Hashi. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, I, I guess I'll preface it, your, your question or my response by saying that we did very much closely follow the Broughton report and what's unique or what's interesting about the report itself is that it highlights um, a path forward to try and avoid uh, the failure or lack of sustainability of past initiatives. As one of the members have stated, past initiatives haven't always had the staying power uh, for lots of different reasons. Um, what the Broughton Report outlined was what are those things that could be a difference maker to ensure that this particular effort is sustained over time and does have the impact and the results and the feelability of the business community that uh, past efforts may not have. Um, so some of the recommendations that were made in that report included things like having a standalone office where previous efforts have not had a standalone office. They talked about leadership from the very top. Um, the office does have leadership from the very top um, and that's also uh, across all departments as well. Uh, it talked about the importance <coughs> of focusing on measurement. Um, as my colleague Mr. Crooks has mentioned, we've developed a business impact assessment tool so we can measure um, the cost and savings of regulatory proposals. It talked about ensuring that uh, that um, uh, an initiative on regulatory reform had a focus on service, understanding that service effectiveness does 
place or lack of service effectiveness does place a burden uh, on businesses of all sizes. It talked about taking a regional approach uh, to regulatory reform, so it not just being Nova Scotia doing it on its own, but getting the benefits of economies of scales across the region. It talked about setting targets. Uh, we have a $25 million dollar, dollar target we, which we have every intent on accomplishing. It talked about outlining principles, so having some vision for what a good regulatory environment looks like for Nova Scotia. as. Fred has mentioned, Mr. Crooks, sorry, as Fred has mentioned, um, those principles have been adopted not just in Nova Scotia but across the four Atlantic provinces and that's unique across the country when it comes to regulatory reform. As well, the Broughton Report talked about the importance of enshrining some of those principles in legislation. Uh, as you may know, Nova Scotia has its first ever uh, regulatory accountability um, and uh, reporting act. Uh, and again, that's not just a piece of legislation here in Nova Scotia, it's mere legislation across the four Atlantic provinces. So those are all of those pieces that were uh, outlined in the recommendations of the Broughton Report have all been implemented by our office. Great. So, um, have you been a difference maker? Uh, uh, I would like to think that we're, we're, we're making a difference. I mean, I wouldn't, I certainly wouldn't be in my role, nor would any of my colleagues in our very small office be in our role if we didn't think that we were making a difference. We do understand that the burden of regulation is, is felt in many places, and I should say too, it's not just the province that owns that burden. There are different levels of government that own the, own the burden, there are self-regulating bodies that own the burden, but for our piece that we own, um, and I think as Fred had mentioned, many of the in the business community would say as well, uh, we are making a difference. Is it fast enough? Is it enough? It, it, does it satisfy us? Absolutely not. I mean, uh, we, we very much see the regulatory system and its improvement as a significant economic lever. Uh, APEC outlined in spades how big that lever is. Um, so yes, we are making a difference. There is much more difference to be made. So you're a standalone office. Um, why not just be part of the Department of Business? Like why a separate, you know, office, um, separate deputy minister? Like why is, has that happened? Mr. Crooks. Um, I guess for for a number of reasons, um, uh, we felt uh, I felt that was important. Uh, best practice is that uh, whether in the UK, uh, in other parts of Europe, and elsewhere, is that for a for a an office like ours, which is really cutting against the grain of much of government. And that's 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 you know, there's no there's no I don't think better way to describe it. For an office like ours to be effective on a sustained basis, it really needs leadership from the top. So uh, I was convinced that this was an office that uh, uh, really needed to report to the Premier. That's, that's one thing. Secondly, uh, it's, a, it's a, by definition, we wanted a small office. We didn't want it, um, uh, and, and it is, uh, we're few in number, and frankly, um, in a larger organization, private sector or public sector, it's very easy to get swept up in the job of day-to-day -day management of a department or an agency. Uh, and we knew, again, from best practice and our own instincts, that if we were going to make, we're, we're operating across a pretty broad field here to try and make a difference. And if we were going to make a difference, we were, we were going to have to uh, really be intensely focused on a narrow set of objectives, especially given how short a time we have to, to uh, achieve them. So, so our judgment was taking all of that into consideration. We really did need to be a separate and standalone office, and it, and it is what uh, I think what, what uh, Commissioner Broughton uh, recommended. Um, and I, I think it's been, uh, based on experience, I think it's been borne out uh, mm -hmm. to have been the right to have been the right call, not only by us, but by the departments that we're working with. Mm -hmm. um, because it hasn't gotten in the way of having a, of, of a, a good dialogue and good relationship with the departments, but there is a distance there, and they know we've got a job to do, which is cross-governmental, um, and um, they, they, um, they understand, I think, a little better than than if we had been an add-on somewhere else, um, how central this mandate is, or our mandate to 
uh, the government's uh, business and economic uh, priorities. So you report to the Premier, like, is that weekly? Is it, um, does he call you up and ask you for a report? Or, you know, how much reporting to the Premier do you actually do? Well, uh, I would start by saying that the Premier, uh, uh, frankly, when he appointed me, and this was, uh, this was of interest to me um, and, and, and his approach, was that if we're going to do this, we have to have latitude uh, and we've got to have the ability to do and say some things that, um, uh, to identify our priorities based on the advice of external stakeholders, not simply based on what um, internal analysis might suggest. And that's why we look to people like our, uh, to, to APEC and to others to help set our priorities and to do and say some things that may not be, um, uh, how can I put it, things that might typically come out of, a, uh, out of an operational department. So lots of latitude. Um, I, I uh, am in touch with the, with the Premier and the Deputy Minister to the Premier probably once a month. Okay, good. Um, so you have a five-year mandate. Yes, our office has a, our office actually, we have a, we have a five-year mandate. At, at the three-year point, uh, we're, we've got to uh, do a review of Which the is office. what, when would that be? Well, that will be in 2018. Okay, and, and a $25 million target. Right. Okay, so do you have a draft timeline? Timeline for? For um, getting your work done. Or, I mean, if, well, if it ceases yes. at five years, you know, what do you hope to have accomplished within that five years? You may get an extension, you may not. Right. So, so if, in the, in the, uh, if there's no extension, um, then, then, and so you're looking at what's been accomplished in, in five years and what would we aspire to accomplish in five years, I think uh, the uh, embedding a process in, uh, first of all, getting, uh, getting a uh, charter of principles adopted across the region uh, a common approach to regulatory principles is an important thing. That would be, uh, we would hope, enduring. Uh, we would hope that uh, the process that we've embedded for the business impact assessment in Nova Scotia and the costing tool would be embedded and utilized as a matter of practice on an ongoing basis without us uh, by departments. And departments, we've made sure to do this, to, to add that process onto uh, what departments do in a way that they'll be able to handle, they'll be able to deal with it, w and won't need us uh, necessarily to be involved. Um, we would we would like to get, uh, we'd like to see uh, uh, even more progress on regional initiatives, and perhaps by that time, maybe some sort of uh, more formal regional body uh, to drive regulatory reform across the Atlantic region because with the adoption of the, or the pending adoption of the internal agreement on, or the agreement on internal trade nationally, the opportunity for Atlantic Canada is significant to drive that, to drive that agenda, that, that uh, bring the barriers down agenda very hard because Atlantic Canada benefits from trade, uh, liberal, internal trade liberalization at twice the rate as the rest of the country. Uh, because of the significance of trade. So we'd like to make sure that we've got our strong place at the table uh, uh, for the uh, national agenda. Um, and we'd like, to, we'd like to know, we'd like to uh, hopefully our business navigator service, th that pilot uh, ends this year. Um, if, if it produces results and demonstrates that uh, in fact this is a material help to businesses, then uh, then we'd, uh, you know, that's something that we would hope might continue. Mm -hmm. So those are, those are, if we, if we, if we uh, really bear down on it, what we'd, what we'd love to leave if, if, uh, the, if the five-year term is, is it, we'd love to leave uh, uh, a more rigorous process focused on cost of business in the regulatory review process provincially. We'd like to have a robust pro uh, program regionally that we could leave, uh, and we'd like to have enhanced uh, service to regulated, uh, regulated businesses, programs that would be. So that's our, that's in very, very, in the broadest possible terms, that's our, okay. that would be our hope. 
Thank you. Um, a couple of times you've mentioned stakeholders. Who are your stakeholders? I'm going to let Leanne, Leanne is our uh, is executive director of stakeholder engagement, so uh, Leanne, is, okay. Le Leanne works closely, if you don't mind, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Hashi. Great, thank you. Um, we have uh, the business community essentially is a primary stakeholder, however, we also engage uh, semi-regularly with the labor community as well. So stakeholders would be um, business associations, business owners, industry associations, um, so anywhere and in all parts of the province as well. So chambers of commerce, um, which includes regional bodies such as the Atlantic Chamber of Commerce, and then uh, uh, local chambers of commerce, so the Halifax Chamber of Commerce, the Pictou County Chamber of Commerce, the Truro and Colchester Cham Chamber of Commerce. Um, all of those groups, uh, all of those, yeah, straight area Chamber of Commerce. So we are in regular contact with our stakeholders because what we know from past initiatives is that you really do need the ongoing input and support of the business community if we are going to make a difference and if they are going to feel the difference. And we feel extremely fortunate uh, for the stakeholder group that we've built. Uh, in fact, in our annual report, our first annual report in uh, June of 2016, one of the things that we made a point of mentioning is that the annual report wasn't ours alone, it is everyone's. That's how much the business community has been involved in our work. Okay. Um, one of the questions I get as, a, as an MLA, and a lot of it surrounds the Building Code of Canada and how it affects um, businesses, especially I come from, you know, and I represent two communities that are very much heritage communities, um, and there's a lot of regulations around maintaining your heritage status. Um, and we have businesses wanting to open up, but um, they call the red tape, some, you know, the accessible washrooms, the, um, sometimes they can't put a ramp in because of um, defacing a building or just not having the room on, you know, some of these buildings, they don't even have a driveway. Um, are you part of that, like trying to resolve this so that we do have accessibility for our citizens yet? You know, this is a federal legislation. You know, I find it very complicated. You know, municipalities are, are left to deal with, the, the, I call it the follow, because they're, they're the ones that have to give out, issue the permits to the business owners. Yet it's a federal regulation. Like, do you have anything to do with this? Mr. Crooks? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We, uh, not a whole lot in the sense that um, we, uh, the, the National Building Code, as you indicated, is a, is a technical document that, that is a, you know, there's a, there's a, uh, a huge sort of national process for developing those standards, uh, which includes a lot of consultation with the, with the uh, development community and others. Uh, and and uh, is 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 uh, and has to the extent it has regional variations. They're usually based on uh, climate differences and 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 things like that. But I think what you're getting at. So we, when Nova Scotia looks to adopt uh, uh, its version of the National Building Code or updated it recently, we were certainly asked because it was regulatory to have a look at it. And we uh, there were our main focus was look are there things in there that that add to what may be necessary uh, in terms of the general principles that are a national standard. And there, we were satisfied there weren't. Uh, and so um, it, it's really important to have a national standard for this purpose. So there's a, there's a fairly limited latitude for um, altering the National Building Code itself. There's a defined process for doing it. It's a national process and so on. But I think a lot of the things you're getting at are things that arise out of not necessarily just the Building Code, but municipal regulation. And, and we've been, uh, uh, th that's an area that, even though it's not directly within our mandate an area of responsibility at this stage, it's an area where we've been working, because we understand business uh, there's there's you know we're, we're talking about the business businesses don't they kind of generally understand that there's federal provincial and municipal regulation but they're just trying to deal with regulation so the primary issue for them is not who is it uh, the primary issue for them is how am I constrained um, so what we've been doing we realize that to be 
uh, at all successful in our office, we can't focus exclusively on provincial regulation. We've got to be working with our federal and municipal partners to make the experience, particularly for people who are looking for help through our navigation service, for example, to make the experience seamless so that we don't end up just saying, oh, that's federal, you've got to go talk to the feds, or that's provincial or municipal, you've got to go talk to the local council. Uh, we're trying to sort of make the experience more seamless. We've also got, a, uh, uh, as you may know, a partnership with, uh, uh, that we've entered into with uh, HRM, which, uh, uh, which includes a, an advisory group uh, that, that uh, is intended to address uh, issues of red tape at the municipal level. Um, in, and, and to do that together, recognizing that, again, uh, uh, there's areas of overlap and conflict between federal or between provincial and municipal regulation, and we want to minimize that as much as we can. Can you do you think you could expand that program to rural Nova Scotia? Yeah, well, Is that we, a possibility? in fact, we've we've yes, we've started with Halifax. Okay. Um, Halifax had a particular interest in this, and we uh, um, uh, we wanted to respond to that. Um, but we're, for example, we've recently uh, uh, had a conversation with the Union of, of Nova Scotia Municipalities about exactly that. So we're, yes, uh, we're, again, we've we got to be mindful there are only so many of us, and we don't want to be going out saying, look, if we only had 15 or 20 more people, we could probably do this and that. Okay. We want to keep to... Thank you. Yeah. I want to move on. I only have two minutes left. Okay, so I want, I want to talk about your regional initiatives because, um, you know, I see the Premier make make announcements. He goes, goes um, and meets with um, the regional Premiers and they've made announcements regarding regulatory issues. So... Obviously, that doesn't happen in a one-day meeting. So your, your department must go in there and do some groundwork before these meetings take place. So what, what is the process? What, what happens? What's your role? Can I, Mr. Chairman, I might ask uh, Ms. Hashi. Ms. Hashi. Thank you for the question. Um, so just coming back to the Broughton report and even the One Nova Scotia report, those two reports talked about the importance of four very small provinces working together uh, to get economies of scale and to make it easier for our businesses to gain access to new markets. Uh, the report by the Atlantic Provinces uh, Economic Council uh, said very clearly that our four small provinces are more dependent on internal trade than anywhere else in the country. Yet it's more costly for our four provinces, our businesses within our four provinces, to trade interprovincially because we're very small and fragmented. So to give you uh, uh, an illustration, uh, take a business in Lunenburg. If that business, if one of your constituents wanted to access Order. the... I'm sorry, but the time has expired for that round, but if you wish to add your answer on at the, at the next opportunity, you can do that if the uh, member wishes uh, the next round. We'll move back to Mr. Houston, the PC caucus, for 12 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Has your office been involved in any labour negotiations? Have you advised the Premier on labour negotiations with teachers or any other party? Mr. Crooks. Uh, uh, no, uh, our, no, no, not our office, no. Okay. Have you, have you in, in, your, in your capacity personally, have other you provided the, other, some advice? Other, other than, uh, to, other than um, um, run into people in the hall and have conversations, no. No, okay. I, have no I have no formal involvement okay. in the labour file at all. Okay, thank you. Um, in October 2015, the Nova Scotia government amended weight and dimension regulations for commercial vehicles and, that it, and, and indicated it was signing a memorandum that would bring Nova Scotia regulations in line with most other jurisdictions. Was that memorandum actually signed? Has there been a memorandum signed okay, that ahead, brings the, ahead, the I'm dimension? I'm not 100% sure if I'm clear about the document. but Ms. Hashi? I, I think what you uh, thank you. I think what you may be referring to is a memorandum of understanding that was signed between Ontario, Quebec, New Brunswick, and Nova Scotia to align their weights and dimensions to make long combination to make long combination vehicles move more freely and less costly from one. Yeah. From yes. So was it something that was? Is it done, or was it a concept of something that we'd be working towards? Sounds like it was signed, was it? It's well, I think it, it, it was. It was the Department of Transportation that led that, so they would really be the ones to answer that question. Because it predates it's, your office, it, I guess. Uh, I, I think the, the one that I'm thinking of was signed. I think in okay. the, the fall of of 2016, or it was announced in the fall of 2016. Okay. Mr. Crooks. 
Yeah. Sorry, Mr. Chair. We'll follow up on that to make sure we're talking about yeah, this. So Whatever just, we, we want to be, you know, it's sure. just a question of making sure we're clear on okay. which document. Okay. Um, in 2014, the Builders Lean Act was amended, um, and this was a, this was an amendment. You might be familiar with this one. It's it's it has to do with publishing of the substantial completion dates. There's a lot of frustration in the construction industry of. Has it been substantially completed? Can I get my yeah. pay? And and the idea behind the act uh, was that it would it would be a central place they could go and look at a website and see okay that project is substantially complete. I'm um, due my money. It's a very significant thing um, to people in that industry. Um, the act passed the legislature. To my knowledge, was never proclaimed. Are you are you familiar with this? Uh, with this situation, yes, we are we are familiar with it, and and uh, <clears throat> and we have um, uh, given advice on it. Uh, but I again, on the on the basis of uh, advice to a minister, I've I really uh, can't get into it. But I, yeah, okay. we are we are we are familiar with it. Let me ask you: this, Have the, has it been proclaimed? Have the have the amendments been proclaimed? Um, I'd have to. I don't, to be honest with you, I don't recall whether it was a matter of the amendments being proclaimed or or uh, regulations being adopted. To be honest with you, okay. I'd have to. I, ca I can't say for sure, yes or no. Okay. I I th I think my recollection is is that it was um, uh, it was more uh, how was it go how was it going to be implemented and uh, and the regulatory regime that. Okay, so your your office is aware of it, yes, like we presumably are. in an official capacity, probably yes, we because are. people in the industry are yes, we are. We, pretty in upset fact, that it hasn't happened. Yes, we are, um, and we've been we've been we've been in uh, we've spoken with people uh, we've mm. spoken with people in the industry about it, and we're yes, we so are. So I'm just trying it. to understand. It, it gets it gets passed through the legislature, right? Probably in an all-night sitting. Maybe it was a big emergency for this government at the time to pass it through. Maybe we had to sit for 24 hours. But now here we are, three years later, and it's not proclaimed. Is that a? Would you? Would that fall into the category of kind of regulatory concerns for your office? That seems bizarre to me. That you, you pass a piece of legislation and then just sit on it. I don't understand why they would do that. Well. <clears throat> I, I don't know, to be honest with you, the answer to that question. Uh, but, you just, but you just know that it hasn't been proclaimed. I just, and, you know that, and you know that industry And I know has, there's an issue. Industry has a lot of angst over it. Yes, I know that. And, okay. and, uh, and, and we've given, some, and we've given ad, uh, advice on it. Yes. Okay. I, I, I know those things. Yeah. Okay. And, but you, you can't say whether the advice was as simple as you should really proclaim this. You shouldn't dangle well, think, industry I, along for I three it, years on something. I think, it goes, I think it would go beyond what I can legitimately uh, discuss oh. here. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know. I guess it presumably uh, I can't ask you for your opinion on, on, on legislation being passed in the legislature and then three years later not being proclaimed. Do you have a general opinion well, on I that? Well, I, 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 th I think... Um, uh, there, I think there may be, uh, it, it depends on, I would have thought it depends on, on uh, uh, the circumstances. Uh, it may be that, uh, that uh, and I'm not talking about this case, but the, but the concept of passing legislation and not proclaiming it, it's not unheard of, obviously. Um, it may be that uh, there is a, a second thought. The, the power to uh, reserve on proclamation is there for a reason, which is uh, uh, the, the uh, government presumably wants to have the ability to, to uh, withhold implementation until such time as the circumstances are right, and maybe the circumstances change. I really, you know, it's... it's so this, is, this, is a, this would speak to the very high level of dissatisfaction that business owners feel with government. It would speak exactly to a business owner and Nova Scotians ability to trust government, because it's been passed in the legislature. Right. If they don't want to proclaim it, for, it's 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 terrible to, to string a whole entire industry along for that amount of time. Maybe we'll we'll leave it at that. I guess it's probably exhibit. I would say exhibit A, B, or C, but I'll probably be down to exhibit X, Y, or Z as to this government 
not thinking things through. And that's the only way you would pass a piece of legislation and then not proclaim it for three years is you didn't think it through to begin with. So I don't think that would surprise many Nova Scotians. It's probably just what happened again here. But I'm glad to hear that your office is aware of it. I know the industry is anxious for these things to be proclaimed. Maybe you can use some of the power of your office to, to bring it to a head one way or the other. Either we're going to proclaim it or we're not. Uh, it's it's completely incompetent to the situation that exists with that. I will I will ask if you are familiar with the situation around permits for uh, moving things on the highways, large buildings and stuff like that. And I want to ask very specifically about the process to get a permit to move a construction crane from point A to point B. Um, that's something that I hear about. It can take weeks to get a permit. Sometimes when you're trying to move something on yeah. you don't really have time to wait weeks and then and then it's, it gets even even more humorous because it would be humorous if it wasn't so damaging to our economy is that if you get a permit to move it there and move it back but the job takes a little bit longer and you can't move it on the same day you're back into the process of weeks to move your your crane is this something that you're this is the kind of the common sense stuff that we would, people would like to see addressed, uh, right? Absolutely, and that. Uh, uh, thank you for the question. It's 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 something that we're aware of and and uh, have been uh, working on in terms of uh, at least we, on on the in the area of oversized vehicles and permitting, and particularly getting coordination between Nova Scotia and New Brunswick uh, in those areas. So we're we're um, we're. Uh, Leanne, you're probably, Ms. Hashi is probably better able, Mr. Chairman, to, to identify where that is at the moment in terms of... Ms. Uh, Hashi. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, I don't have any additional information on that one. Uh, uh, Mr. Crooks is right. We have been looking at the overdimension permitting between New Brunswick and Nova Scotia in terms of some of the common sense things that the business community has brought to our attention. They would be um, also areas that we have done work on, such as aligning the minimum wage amongst the three maritime provinces, aligning record keeping amongst the three maritime provinces. Um, uh, ensuring that uh, common solicitation documents so that a business that bids uh, it to the Nova Scotia government uh, has the forms have the same look and feel as those uh, in New Brunswick and PEI. <laughs> so would you say, would it be fair to say that issues like these, specific issues like this, are kind of down in the weeds and you never got down in the weeds yet in your mandate? Would that be fair? Um, well, I, Mr. Crooks. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd say we're, we're down in the weeds. Like, this is an issue that concerns us. Okay. Like we are, this is a, this is a live issue, and um, and um, uh, quite frankly, to be honest, uh, to be very straight up with you, when I go back to the office, I'm going to make a phone call to find out where where that is because it's been, it's uh, we we've, we've had several conversations about it. I know there's a a recognition in the department here in the Department of Transportation that this is something that uh, I know the deputy is very focused on wants to address we've heard it we we've talked to a number of stakeholders about it so I'm gonna go you know frankly doesn't do the in terms of my answer this morning it doesn't do the committee well, much good let's see if you can give me an update, or I, update I'm happy to do that that'd be fine happy I'll, to do uh, that I accept that I appreciate I, I, that happy to do that so um, the Atlantic, I forget the name of the Atlantic Provinces Economic Council said if, if red tape can be reduced by 10%, could increase the GDP of, the, of Atlantic Canada by a billion dollars. That's yep. the Atlantic. That's, actually, that's only maritime. Okay, maritime. That, that okay. Doesn't even, doesn't, that was before. Can you fine tune that a little more? If we, what's the Nova Scotia number? Do you have a sense of what the Nova Scotia number is? And you mentioned the red tape in the province could be in the in 200 million that's the cost right. of red tape right but what is the what's the positive impact of that if we can reduce red tape now we're talking about the the increase in economic activity it might not be something that's looked at so I'm just I, curious I, if it is I don't know that they break it down in their report but we could but I mean I'm sure it is I'm sure that number is available okay and, it's, and I'd be happy to because I, I don't the, have that off the top of my head mr. Houston the 25 million target yes. for red tape reduction I don't know if so you wouldn't have a, the corresponding side of, well, if we can achieve this target and reduce red tape by 25 million, we're probably going to increase GDP by X dollars. It might not be something that was looked at. No, so we don't. We, it wasn't looked at, okay. to be honest with you. Okay. Uh, but but uh, we can ask the question if, if there's a, if there, it's, it's okay. as you know, trying to link, um, uh, APEC has done it at a very macro level. Mm -hmm. 
uh, trying to link specific measures at the more micro level to changes in GDP is pretty tough science for, okay. for people. But I, I you know, <clears throat> open to open to uh, at least seeing is there over the long haul a principle here that will allow us? Because frankly, we'd love it if yeah. we could show. So you would say, would it just order? Sorry, time has expired. We'll move to the NDP caucus and Mr. Wilson. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, and I, I don't know if I've seen it in some of the information that was provided to us, but just uh, just for the uh, for the committee's uh, knowledge, what, what's the overall what's the annual cost uh, to taxpayers for the, for the office? What's the annual annual budget? Six million. One point six million. Did you uh, did you request? Uh, <laughs> I know I probably won't get the answer to this, but did you request an increase in in the budget uh, in the uh, that the, we'll see next Friday, next yeah, Thursday? I, I I'm under uh, I'm a, I'm a novice to government, but one thing I'm under strict instructions about is <laughs> talking about anything to do with the budget, <coughs> which I guess makes sense. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I'll keep trying. I know there, I know that uh, yeah. that we'll have to wait a week. Um, I, I I will say this uh, that that the 1.6 million annualized uh, in, in the year past doesn't include the uh, cost of the um, navigation pilot um, that was. So uh, I think the navigation, the navigation pilot uh, was for the period of time, which I, it came into, into effect uh, January 1, uh, was something in the order of a hundred thousand but I, many, I'd have to check that number how many uh, so how many FTs do you have we have we have eight uh, we have eight uh, sort of permanent FTEs uh, and we have while this pilot this pilot is a one-year pilot there are four FTEs associated with that pilot okay but they're the pilots one year and they're okay. if the as, if the pilot stops at a pilot that's that's it so four, four in the navigate, uh, navigation to the pilot, right. right? Okay. Right. And that's a one year. Is that January to January? Right. So, so if it was going to be continued, then we may see that in the the upcoming budget. If it you was going to be, if it, if if it was going to be continued beyond the end of January. Um, well, the only thing again, I'm getting into, uh, I'm getting it. I don't know what's in the budget, to be honest with you. But I can say this: that on the pilot, uh, we will be, uh, we're gathering data on the on the pilot, um, uh, and we will be until probably September, October, and that's the point at which we'd be making a decision as to whether the the uh, pilot should continue. Okay. So um, that's uh, yeah. Yeah. No, that's fair. In the uh, in your first uh, annual report, I know uh, reading through the, uh, the the news release from uh, CNS, uh, you had indicated that uh, the year ahead the office will focus on uh, introducing measurements and target settings to reduce regulatory burdens on services and improvements around uh, regulations. W wouldn't wouldn't those measurements wouldn't they and the targets wouldn't they have been something that would have been there on the on outset, like on, at the start of uh, the office, or it's a good, it's could a, you just clarify maybe that it's statement? A good, it's a good question. Um, we, uh, when we started, we were we had no baseline really. We had no, we really had to. So what we decided to do was to say, okay, the first thing we need, we know that measurement, uh, some form of measurement, is key to accountability. Um, and there are a variety of measurement tools. Uh, different jurisdictions do it different ways. Some, some jurisdictions count uh, regulations and say we're going to reduce the count by X percent. Some jurisdictions have uh, government prepare, uh, public service prepare estimates of what they believe are the hours spent on compliance and then produce an estimate that way. Um, we, we, we thought the most meaningful thing to do was, was to Choose a method which which um, was a reliable that our, both our stakeholders and the public service thought was a reliable model for estimating cost uh, to businesses through a, a, a regulatory uh, the introduction of a new regulation. So um, we had to spend some time getting that designed. That took a fair amount of time uh, to get that designed, but that was key infrastructure 
for that was number one deciding what the measure should be. So, so in other words, dollars, not numbers of regulations to be counted, uh, not numbers of hours estimated by public service, but dollars actually incurred, or like estimated to be incurred rather, uh, by businesses based in part on business input. So with that, that's the kind of the measure. Now the target was something, uh, getting to the target, which uh, the, the uh, target was announced at uh, $25 million in reduction by the, uh, by the Ministry of Finance. Getting to the target uh, took some time. We wanted the benefit of, of some experience in the, in, the, in the job in actually doing reductions. We wanted to see you know, what kind of pace uh, uh, we could reasonably expect to achieve in terms of doing reductions. Where are the sort of biggest opportunities? What do our stakeholders uh, identify and consider to be the main pain points? And so putting all that together, we got to the point where uh, we were comfortable making a recommendation as to what a, uh, both what an appropriate measurement would be, which is dollars of estimated uh, uh, cost, and a target of $25 million, which is uh, what's been. So I know what you mean, wouldn't you start with a, but, but we thought there was some underlying preparatory work and some analytical work that needed to be done in the first year to put us in a position to do something that would be, I mean, you will know. We see, will we see more of a, uh, a list in, in in the in the update in June on oh, I, I, on the you know, you'll see to, to support the twenty five million dollar yes. uh, target. Okay. Yes. So, uh, what's the relationship uh, or dialogue with uh, municipalities uh, around the province? They uh, they have their own rules, bylaws, permits, uh, permit requirements, and I know often there is uh, there is duplication. Um, so what, what kind of dialogue or relationship do you have with, uh, with the municipalities around, around Nova Scotia? I would say, um, I would say strong, uh, but we've got more work to do. Uh, strong and, in, and, and aligned, I would say, in HRM, um, and, and evolving uh, through uh, UNSM with the other municipalities. I, and we have, not, um, we have not had any pushback. I, I, think, I, I think what we've heard from some municipalities outside Halifax uh, is, look, how do we sign on? Because we'd, like uh, we'd like to participate, and, and so we're following up on that. Uh, but uh, but, but I, I think the, the attitude is not okay. Well, that's the province doing this, and we want to do our own thing at all. I think, I think the I think the reaction is, and and there's support in the um, particularly in in some of those municipalities on the part of the local chambers with our work because we've got strong relationships with the local chambers. I think uh, the the uh, the perception is good, the feeling is good, and the relationship. Uh, we want to strengthen it. Uh, we want to expand our reach, but. Positive, I would say. And the other, the other part of this that we haven't really, really looked at, I probably, should, you know, I, I know you didn't ask about this, but there are two aspects of municipal regulation that we can be, where we can be focused. One is, how can we work together with existing, you know, provincial and municipal regulations to make them more seamless? The other thing is, is the is is does provincial regulation hamstring municipalities in some areas? where if they were freed up, they could uh, do more in terms of promoting the local business climate. So that's something else that, that we're thinking are you, about. Are you compiling, uh, you know, duplicate regulations? Are you, are you identifying them? And, and if so, uh, or if not, why not? If so, uh, how are you, how are you dealing with the municipalities? Are, are you trying to come to an understanding that one of the parties Stands down or backs away and allows the uh, uh, the other to to uh, continue on. Or how, have you done that, or is that no. something you're? No, to be honest with you, we haven't we haven't compiled lists of duplicate regulations. And in fact, that's a I, I, we've got a uh, we've got a sort of a five year mandate with a three year evaluation point. I, I could safely say, looking at the experience in other jurisdictions, I could safely say that. A body like this, a body like our office, 
if it was if 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 the four Atlantic provinces and the and the municipalities, uh, if this became sustained and serious, there's 15, 20 years of work here to to get all of that to get to that level where we're eliminating uh, uh, every area of duplication. But there's but there's um, uh, I think what we're instead what we're focused on at the start of the relationship is. Um, are we, are we dealing, recognizing that service is a big part of regulatory burden? Are we handling our business customers uh, in a coordinated way so that we're saving them time, which in turn can be measured uh, in terms of reduction of burden? So that's kind of our starting point. But would I like to be able to, same as the total provincial burden. We haven't costed the total provincial burden because we want to. But it's a ma that's a major exercise. Britain spent, I think, 20 billion pounds um, uh, doing that in the in the United Kingdom. Europe spent more than that again. So the other thing we're trying to balance here, not not to apologize for not getting on with uh, some of these things, we're trying to balance getting the right work priorities, but not inventing something that's so big in scope in terms of the bureaucracy that, that it's more expensive than is sensible for a jurisdiction the size of Nova Scotia. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. We'll move back to the Liberal Caucus and Ms. Lonis Croft. Uh, I just would like to go back to uh, Ms. Hache um, to talk a, bit, a little bit more about the regional initiatives. We were sort of cut off there, but I I'd like to hear more about that. And, and you were about to give us an example, but I just want to know, is, does the apprenticeship um, qualifications for the um, banking hours and whatnot, is that all part of your work too, or? Ms. Hashey? Thank, uh, thank you for the question. That specific piece was done by the apprenticeship agency. Um, oh, through the labor and advanced right. education, that's, that's so it had nothing to do with your department. Okay, but can you follow through with yeah, the example you were about yeah, to give? Yeah, absolutely. Earlier? So, uh, and my apologies for not uh, watching time last time. So, I, where I was at was just um, the challenge some of our businesses are face in our province and our region in accessing those new markets, which we need our businesses to do if we want them to grow. So what the APEC report outlined was a business in Lunenburg, if they wanted to access the Atlantic market, which in totality is 2.2 million, they would need to go through four different provincial sets of rules and regulations to access that market. Contrast or place that business now in Kingston, Ontario. That business in Kingston, Ontario can access a market six times the size of our entire Atlantic market and only go through one provincial rule, standards of rules and regulations. So in essence, what APEC said was that our businesses, by our pure size, are at a competitive disadvantage relative to businesses, their competitors, in our other parts of the country. So that is the underlying why. Why are we tackling this at a regional level? So to your question, how do we identify what areas we work on as a region? And if you think regulatory reform in one province is tough, try doing it with, with uh, four jurisdictions. It's, it's very tough, important, but very tough work. In terms of identifying priorities, we're very fortunate that APEC provided um, a path for the highest priority areas. As we've mentioned, we have a limited mandate, a uh, time frame to make a difference. We're very focused on making a difference and achieving results. And they said if you could focus on strategic areas like transportation or those parts of the economy that impact all businesses, whether you're a construction company or whether you're a real retail operation, those would be workers' compensation, labor standards, um, uh, labor mobility, so those are the areas that we focused on. So we focused on uh, transportation. How, the, how it works is we get input from the business community. So on transportation, coming back to the carrier profile, um, we had a team of business stakeholders identify transportation as, as a critical area. Then we said to them, in transportation, there are probably a thousand different areas that we could work on as a region. Name one that we could tackle. So they talked about their carrier profile, that report card, to allow trucking to move more freely within our region. We developed a team of interprovincial folks in the four Atlantic provinces who are experts in their area and said, can you walk... Up 
develop a plan for how we can standardize that carrier profile. So that's essentially how the systems, how, how the regional initiatives are developed. So from outside input from the business community, because again, there is no point in us doing our work if it's not informed by the business community and if it doesn't have an impact on the business community. But the experts to find the way through live within government. So it's teams of interprovincial folks in the area of transportation, in work, uh, labor standards, in workers' compensation, in procurement that identify one or two or three things in those strategic areas that they can work on and move forward. Okay, and so the Premier's role in the, the regional uh, initiatives is? Yes, so, so we've been, uh, I'll start and then, uh, we've been working this through the Council of Atlantic Premiers. Um, again, coming back to the Broughton Report, and the Broughton Report talking about the importance of leadership at the very top. Um, the Council of Atlantic, Atlantic Premiers has been our vehicle to move some of these things forward. So do you see good leadership? Or is that uh, opinion? <laughs> Mr. Crooks. Mr. Chairman, uh, one, of the, one of the things, I think we've mentioned this, that's uh, key, <coughs> critically key, to uh, an initiative like this having uh, uh, success is leadership at the top. And for Nova Scotia and the other provinces, that means the premiers. And, and we think we've seen uh, uh, very strong leadership from the four premiers. Uh, in driving this agenda forward. And it would not work uh, without that uh, shared commitment. And, and the interesting, uh, one of the interesting things about this is we thought that we would, you put four technical teams together uh, from different provinces. Our expectation was that uh, this is just gonna be, this is gonna be a bit of a nuisance and a job of work for them, uh, not their day job. Uh, you know, whether they're in the Departments of Labor or Transportation or whatever. The feedback we've gotten from the public servants who are working together with their colleagues in other departments is, hey, we actually, as we've said, look, should we lighten up on you? Frankly, I mean, you probably want a break from this stuff. We know it feels like chipping away at an iceberg. And the reaction was, we should be doing more of this. Uh, we, we, we learn a lot from each other, and there isn't, this, this is a really good opportunity we should be doing more of this kind of work. So, which, which, which is really encouraging to hear because where you're trying to drive a little bit of change to get that kind of buy-in from the people who are uh, working around the table is so okay. important. Thank you very much. I'm going to uh, pass it on to my colleague. Mr. Stroink. Thank you very much and thanks for your time today. And I quite enjoyed your presentation. Um, I guess what I kind of wanted to touch base on was that the CFIB has been brought up in the d discussion here uh, on a negative context. Uh, so I guess what I'm trying to get at here is um, where, are, where do we sit in Canada um, with small business, um, on the small business barometer that they put forward, that the, that the CFIB put forward? Well, uh, first of all, I, w uh, I, I assume you're referring to their report card. Yep. Um, we, we have a, uh, we're at a B. Uh, we we uh, are, I, I believe Quebec and BC are at A. Uh, and I think that, um, I don't know, I'd have to refresh my memory, but I, I think that uh, we're in the third um, yeah. rank. Yeah, top three. We're in the, we're in the uh, yeah, we're in the top three. So um, now, just on that grade, um, I, I don't know, none of us when we're in school would yeah. like to have a B when we yeah. think we, we, we'd prefer to have an A. Yeah. Uh, we're not gonna be, we, have, um, we don't live and die by uh, those scores. We, we directionally, uh, we've got a very strong relationship with CFIB, um, a very productive relationship we feel. Uh, we we started at a I think a D minus, yep. uh, and then we went to a C, a C minus. Uh, Leanne reminds me, <laughs> and now we're at a B. And one of the major uh, one of the major things that uh, CFIB said in terms of continued progress was uh, a target that reflects a an appropriate measurement um, uh, mechanism. So, you know, we're very. Uh, you know, we're, we're uh, type A's, 
uh, so to speak. <laughs> we'd, we'd like to have an A, fast, but uh, we're, we're pleased both at the direction of the grading and their evaluation. They're an important stakeholder and at, and at the collaboration between the two. So that 25 million target that we're setting for, and I guess I should, before I ask that question, I guess what, what I'm trying to use as CFIB seems to be the national standard of, of business confidence for small businesses. I, I was a member for 20 years. They, they do a phenomenal job yes. at, at kind of analyzing. I and would doing, agree. Yeah, and, and, and identifying the issues that are key within, within Nova Scotia and straight across Canada. So my question really quickly, because I do want to follow up with another one, um, is what, what is that $25 million? Will that help us get to the A? Do you think that's that hard target that we've created with anecdotal remarks or anecdotal targets? I, I um, again, I can't speak for CFIB. No, they run their own mechanism. That. But if you're asking my view, uh, my view is yes, uh, that, that, that should contribute to a better overall evaluation. Yeah, and I think that's, that's what I'm trying to get at too, is that without the leadership of the Premier, we would not be able to get to those, those, voter, those uh, confidence within small businesses. And the small business community as a whole, from what I've heard in my time, uh, 12 years as, as being a small business owner, that the confidence is feeling better within Nova Scotia in the sense of the regulatory review. Having that, that ability for HRM now to be part of the conversation, because they own 50% of the regulatory problems that are there. My biggest pet peeve is the encroachments of signage within for small businesses. But what I really want to get down to is what your work does and what all MLAs do. I've used your department on numerous occasions with small business regulatory affairs, and I think that elected officials need to understand that you're there to help them in their communities to figure out the regulatory for And I just want to if you could just explain that, how that's worked, and, that, and our relationship's been great, um, and how that can benefit them. Well, we, uh, um, uh, we feel very, um, we want to be open to uh, helping uh, people who have questions, or people who are representing people who have questions, and often MLAs are the first to hear about uh, a, a regulatory issue or some constraint, and we've, we've tried to be open. We've uh, we've responded to uh, a request from MLAs. Uh, uh, we'd, we'd, I, I was about to say we'd love to have more, uh, <laughs> but uh, that's probably saying we'd love to have more problems identified. But I, you know, it's a really important potential channel, especially uh, of communication with our office, especially now that we have our navigation system. So. To the extent that the uh, question is, are we are we open to working closely with MLAs? Uh, we absolutely are. We we welcome that. I, it would help us. It would, frankly, it would help us do a better job. Excellent. And I think that's kind of what I was trying to lean at is that uh, the, the three or four times that I've used you and just sent you an email this morning on another issue. You know, those are the things that. I think makes a better business climate and, and identifying them and, and identifying them from the experts. So thank you. I think that's all my time anyways. Thank you, Mr. Stroink. Mr. Crooks will allow you a, a brief moment to provide some closing comments. Well, given, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Given my um, negligence in going over time at the beginning, I won't burden you with anything further at the end, save to say, uh, look, I, I really have appreciated the opportunity to uh, hear from members and, and uh, interact with members. Uh, frankly, uh, this has been helpful to us. Uh, some of your questions are things that we're going to take away and think about. I think uh, I, I, they're, they're, uh, this is a very constructive and useful exercise, and I'm pleased and honored. Uh, and I, I know I speak for Leanne in saying uh, pleased and honored uh, to be part of it. And feel free uh, to be in touch with us on any question touching uh, business small or large, we're, we welcome the opportunity. So thank you very much for, uh, for having us in. Thank you for being with us. We do have some committee business. We had some correspondence uh, from the Department of Health and Wellness and the Nova Scotia Health Authority. Uh, there was information that was requested on the March 8th meeting, during that meeting, and uh, you have that before you. Are there any questions? Hearing none, we have another piece of correspondence also from the Department of Health and Wellness listing health infrastructure projects. Any questions on that correspondence? Hearing none. Um, we do have a record of decision, which I believe is before everyone. Uh, this was from our subcommittee meeting on agenda and procedures this morning. <clears throat> there are a number of topics that have been approved by the subcommittee. 
there are a couple at the bottom that I'm going to ask the Auditor General uh, for some advice uh, because they are topics related to audits that that office has completed. Uh, one is the Atlantic uh, Lottery Corporation, um, joint audit of that, and the second is um, um, the Critical Infrastructure Resiliency, which was Chapter 4 of the November 2016 report. And I'd like to ask the Mr. Pickup now uh, if he could recommend uh, witnesses for those for the committee's consideration. Mr. Pickup. Sure, thank you. Uh, for the Atlantic Lottery Corporation, I would recommend three individuals, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why. Uh, firstly, I would recommend the uh, Chief Executive Officer, Brent uh, Scrimshaw, because he would handle a lot of the observations and the recommendations that we make concerning operations. Secondly, I would recommend the Chair of the Board, Sean O'Connor, because a number of the observations and recommendations were at that board level. And finally, I would recommend the Deputy Minister of Communities, Cultures, and and Heritage. They are the lead department on behalf of government and a number of the recommendations based on observations related to the government and governance. So I would recommend those three parties on the Atlantic Lottery Corp. Uh, on the critical infrastructure resiliency, uh, I would also recommend uh, three people. Uh, and it follows, again, out of the observations and recommendations. Firstly, I would recommend the, um, the clerk of the Executive Council. The number one recommendation from that audit went to, went to that person, went to the Executive Council in terms of recommending somebody being in charge. Uh, secondly, I would recommend the Deputy Minister of Municipal Affairs um, in her capacity as head of EMO. 80% um, of the recommendations in that audit went to, went to EMO um, and, and she would be in charge of that. And finally on that one I would recommend the DM of transportation because a number of the operational observations that we had, you know, whether it was things like the Canso Causeway or the Amherst Link fall under the area uh, of transportation. So those are the three that I would recommend uh, from that audit. Thank you, Mr. Pickup. And uh, are members okay with the recommendation? I'm hearing agreement. Um, so to the, to the broader list, are there any questions or comments before we put the, uh, the record of decision to a vote? Hearing none, all those in favor of the topics approved by the subcommittee earlier this morning, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion is carried. Our clerk will take note of that. Our next meeting is on uh, Mr. Houston. Thank you. Just with the, um, with the topics approved, there's quite a range of topics there. I just wonder if we, ha we do have an open date on the 26th next week. Um, I just wonder, it would be a shame to let that open date go unused when we have all this committee business to do. I just wonder if maybe we can ask the clerk to see if one of those witnesses could, uh, could appear before the committee next week. Thank you, Mr. Houston, and uh, we, you're correct, we don't have a meeting scheduled for next week. Uh, we can ask our clerk to, uh, to proceed to see if a witness might be available for next week. Is the committee in favor of that? All those in favor? Those opposed? Uh, our clerk will take note of that and will attempt to gain a witness for next week, and if that is possible, uh, she will notify us by email, and if there are any questions, please contact the clerk or myself. Is there any further business to come before the committee? Hearing none, um, unless there is a meeting that is scheduled for next week, our next meeting would be May 3rd, and that would be on school capital planning, which is Chapter 2 of the Auditor General's November 2016 report. And um, the, we, have a, we would have a briefing from 8.30 to 9 that morning and then the public meeting from 9 to 11. With that, this meeting is adjourned.